The story of Plato, a computer system so far ahead of its time and perhaps the least known major technological 20th century project may strike you as just as impossible a, as the 19th century jet, but Plato really happened. It is a story of inventors, mavericks, hackers, geniuses, visionaries, scientists, and educators who came together not so long ago in the very heart of the Midwest. A story that so disrupts the conventional view of 20th century technology history that it may make you wonder, as it made this author wonder, how could this have happened? Where are the books, the magazine articles, the documentaries, the museum displays that should have covered this story? Why has this story gone untold? Why are we only finding out about this now? And I also find it kind of interesting that, um, and ironic that uh, it may be the case that, and I hope this book will kind of fix this, that um, here in Urbana, Illinois, there is a computer much more famous than Plato from a movie called 2001. Uh, how the 9000 series, how computer from that wonderful film um, is fictional. And yet I think it's way more known than Plato. Plato is a real system built a stone's throw from here and has now largely gone unnoticed outside of, uh, you know, circles that have heard of it, which are, are kind of few and far between. So what is the friendly orange glow? Uh, first thing is, I did not coin the term. It's a term I heard constantly when I used Play-Doh. Um, you'd walk into a darkened classroom, and it seems like a lot of students would prefer to keep the lights off and just be illuminated by you know what I call the color of fire. And um, in a way, you know, sitting in a room in a darkened room with 32 Plato terminals all glowing orange, it was just like being sitting around a campfire. And the same kind of illumination that you would see when you you know flickering in the air, the, the, um, this ephemeral nature, I think, um, was present with Plato. And the kinds of displays that would come out from the uh, plasma display, the, the orange glow, uh, were really remarkable. And um, you know, uh, were far beyond the expectations of most people. When I first saw it in 1979, I was completely blown away. What I literally first saw was a, a bunch of students in a music building at the University of Delaware with headphones on in a darkened room. I'm walking by and browsing the, the, the campus. It was my first week there, and I see someone go, reach out and touch the screen, and they're playing a, a piano keyboard, and there's musical notation, and it's all very high resolution, crisp graphics, and I just I could not believe it. I thought computers were either scrolling text or how am I, you know, um, or some kind of menacing computer that you hear, you see in the depicted films. In 1968, um, Alan Kay, who would become very famous for his work at the uh, uh, Xerox Palo Alto Research Center, um, designing a lot of the software and windows, uh, windowing, GUI environments, graphical, graphical user interface environments with mice and clicking and scrolling and all that kind of stuff. Um, he told me that um, he was completely blown away when he came to a conference here in 1968 and saw the prototype of the plasma display. It is what inspired him to start thinking about what he called the Dyna book, which was essentially the precursor, at least on paper, of the iPad. So let's talk about the dawn of cyberculture a little bit. Um, the, uh, most computer labs in the uh, late 60s, early 70s were locked down kinds of places. If you weren't a lab coat wearing PhD, you probably weren't allowed in. If you were a kid wandering in from a local school, you almost certainly were not allowed in. And yet, that's how the Searle Lab was. Open, inviting, encouraging. If you showed promise, Professor Bitzer, I believe, is largely responsible for that open, welcoming atmosphere of Searle, which caught on like a virus and became basically the culture at Searle. And, but it had an interesting twist to it because a lot of people started wandering in in the early 70s. And part two of my book is called The Fun They Had. And um, 
one uh, person who was pretty famous for developing games told me that what they hadn't realized with Plato is that they had developed the world's greatest pinball machine ever invented. And um, uh, part two is really the story of how the Plato system started changing from being strictly an education system to being much more something that resembles the online world today. What we got um, in a remarkable time period between 1973 and 1974, this 12-month arc, which uh, when you consider what happened in that short time period, you got chat rooms, instant messaging, message forums, personal notes, which were email, uh, multi-user dungeons and multiplayer games, and an online newspaper. And that was just the beginning. It was basically you know, an early app ecosystem, the kind of thing that we would see on the web, the web um, much later, and then on smartphones, you know, only 10 years ago, uh, nine years ago, when, it, when Apple started uh, opening up the iPhone to apps. Um, it became kind of like a uh, billboard top 40 every week. Who, whose program, whose uh, game, or whatever kind of curiosity that someone had created over the last few days would reach the top of, you know, the most popular thing, and you'd, you'd be recognized at parties, like, you wrote so-and-so? We're not worthy. Um, I heard a lot of that. You know, for people over the years. Um, and I, I think um, what's significant is none of these applications were part of the National Science Foundation charter or grant proposal that led to millions of dollars of government money pouring in to fund Plato IV in the early 70s. This was not part of the vision, but this was part of the vision of the kids. And it's the kids, the youth culture, that completely transformed Plato. And it's a testament to the, the lab and to Bitzer as the leader that they did not chase the kids away. They said, come on in and get to work. If you can figure out how this thing works and maybe you can show us. I think these developments represent a, a discontinuity in the timeline of, of computing. They should not have happened so early. The fact that they did suggest um, the inevitability of human nature and computer technology. If you give people sufficiently interesting, powerful tools um, that just so happen, they may be designed for educational interactions uh, where students are interacting with the computerized teacher. But if it turns out that they also help you connect, collaborate, and communicate with other people, um, they will. That's all they'll do. That will become what I call the killer app. And um, it's a phrase that Silicon Valley uses all the time, but I think it really started with Plato. And again, it wasn't by design, it was just like, it emerged, it was inevitable. And um, let me read a quick thing from, from uh, 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 part two of the book about the killer app. Hang on a sec. Um, Only a few minutes exposure to Plato 4 was enough for people to realize that it upended the generally received view of computers up to that point, if one were to accept how books, movies, and media had portrayed them. Plato wasn't the evil, self-aware intelligence, first seemingly benign, but after something going horribly wrong, now bent on destroying humanity. It most certainly wasn't 2001's how, looking back at you through a foreboding round red glass eye. Nor was Plato some boring, number-crunching, tape machine, card reader, data processing behemoth found in big banks and government agencies. Plato was your friends looking back at you through the orange dots.